country of Switzerland is a premier tourist destination for holidaymakers from all over the world. This isn't surprising, as the scenery here is among the most spectacular to be found in the whole of Europe. Visitors are drawn by the impressive mountains, sparkling lakes, clean air, and picturesque villages and towns. One of the most popular destinations is the Bernese Oberland, the southern part of Canton Bern, which is Switzerland's second largest region. Here, the massive peaks of the Swiss Alps, part of the chain which stretches from the south of France to Austria, dominate the landscape. Over half of Switzerland consists of alpine land, with the mountain influence giving the country its unique character and the people their independent nature. The peaks form an impressive backdrop to the Tuna Sea and the Brienza Sea. Originally, these twin lakes formed one sheet of water called the Wendel Sea, which stretched from Thun to Meiringen. However, over the centuries, glacial debris was deposited by the Lucena and Lombach rivers to form an alluvial plain, with the lakes still linked by a narrow river. In the Middle Ages, this whole area was known as Between the Lakes. By the 12th century, an Augustinian priory had been founded here, with the monks rapidly becoming the largest landowners in the region. The monks called their domain by the Latin Interlacus, while the secular settlement, which grew up across the river, used the old Swiss-German name of Untersien. The priory was dissolved during the Reformation, and the extensive holdings and monastic buildings were taken over by the Bernese government. The town expanded greatly during the 19th century when tourism became an important factor in the local economy. Today, it's a popular centre with visitors coming from all over the world to enjoy the varied facilities to be found here. The centre retains a rural atmosphere due to the foresight of 37 local hotel owners and private residents who together purchased the 35-acre Hurmata to form a permanent open space. To cater for aristocratic guests from all over the world, a variety of fine hotels were built, none more splendid than the Grand Hotel Victoria Jungfrau, once two separate establishments which have now combined to form one of Switzerland's premier hotels. A casino was built to provide entertainment for the international visitors. The delightful floral clock in its grounds keeps perfect time, of course. In order to give tourists a panoramic view of Interlaken, a funicular was opened in the summer of 1906, running to the Heimwehflu, a wooded ridge above the southwestern end of the town. Like many Swiss funiculars, it has a single meter gauge track with a midway passing loop. Electricity has been used from the outset to haul the cars up the 186 meter long line. The winding room beneath the top station is open to public view. At the summit, there's the opportunity to change to a rather speedier form of transport. Children of all ages can take a thrilling bob ride on a specially constructed track which runs around the edge of the complex. From the lookout tower and restaurant terrace, there are wonderful vistas over the sparkling blue-green waters of Lake Thun and a bird's-eye view of Untersien. Interlaken West Station, opened by the Bodley Bahn in 1872, looks almost like a model railway from this height. However, railway enthusiasts can watch real models running on a superb layout housed in the Heimwehflu top station, first opened in 1950 and today better than ever. Here, a wide variety of O-gauge Swiss locomotives and stock can be seen in action in an impressive computer-driven show which presents round-the-clock working on the lines. On the other side of Interlaken, the distinctive roof of the Haderkulm restaurant forms a local landmark. This peak is also accessible by funicular, built two years after the Heimwehflu. The line, which runs for over 1,400 metres, is a popular attraction for tourists during summer months. The Harder Funicular, like many of the railways of this region, is managed by the Jungfrauerbahnen, which operates some of the most spectacular lines to be found anywhere in the world. At the end of the 19th century, the potential for tourist railways was recognised and a variety of private companies obtained concessions to run services into the heart of the Bernese Oberland Mountains. 
The Berner Oberlandbahn began their services from Interlaken Ost to Lauterbrunnen and Grindelwald in 1890, and the following August, the Bergbahn Lauterbrunnen Murren opened a funicular and mountain line to connect the two villages. In 1893, a rack line was built from Wilderswil to the Schieniger Platte, and the same year, the construction of the Wengenaubahn allowed travellers to ride up to Kleine Scheidegg. Finally, in 1912, the Jungfraubahn opened its railway through the heart of the Eiger and Munch mountains to Jungfraujoch. We begin our journey at Interlaken Ost station, a busy dual gauge complex which handles both meter and standard gauge trains. There are also two electrical systems in operation. 15,000 volts 16 2 thirds hertz AC and 1,500 volts DC. The first station which opened here in 1874 was a stop on the Bödlibahn line from Deligen to Bönigen, known as Customs House Halt. Initially trains connected with the paddle steamboats on lakes Thun and Brienz, but by the end of the 20th century rail links had been made to the rest of Switzerland. Today the BLS and SBB companies operate a variety of international and intercity services, enabling a colourful assortment of locomotives and rolling stock to be viewed on the tracks. The station was renamed Interlaken Ost in 1891, the year after the BOB line came into service. This is also the terminus of the SBB's only metre gauge line, which runs over the Brunig Pass to Luzern. Although the railway began operations in 1888, passengers had to alight at Brienz and take the paddle steamer to Interlaken. That was until the line was extended along the lake in 1916. Our journey with the Jungfrau railways begins with a ride along the Berner Oberlandbahn line towards Lauterbrunnen and Grindelwald. At 567 metres above sea level, this is the lowest point on the whole network lying almost 2,900 metres in altitude below our final destination at the summit station of Jungfraujoch. A project to build the line was proposed as early as 1873, but because of local opposition led by the powerful coaching operators, permission was not forthcoming. It wasn't until 1887 that a concession was granted to begin building, with the lines to Grindelwald and Lauterbrunnen opening on the 1st of July, 1890. The BOB has operated with electric traction at 1500 DC since 1914. This early changeover was made possible after the building of the Jungfraubahn, who generated electricity for their own trains and were able to offer the BOB their surplus power at a favourable price. Wilderswil station, like that at Interlaken Ost, is dual gauge with the meter gauge tracks of the BOB laid alongside the 800 mm line belonging to the Schinnegerplatte railway. The Schinnegerplatte Bahn opened their tourist line in the summer of 1893, the trains conveying visitors to the mountain viewpoint high above the valley. The railway operated independently for the first 18 months of its existence, but was taken over by the BOB on the 1st of January 1895. The SPB has its own depot and works at Wielerswil, as its stock has no access to the BOB facilities at Zweilutschinen due to the incompatibility of gauges. The level crossing barriers at the station and those on the outskirts of Wielerswil are manually opened and closed, the last such operation in the Jungfrau region. Services run along the Schinniger Platte line only from May to October, so during the winter some of the catenary on the upper sections of the line is removed to avoid avalanche damage. This is made possible with the assistance of the SPB's only remaining steam loco, number 5, 
which propels the works train when the electric current is disconnected. For the first few hundred metres, our 800 mm track lies next to the BOB's metre gauge rails, the different widths being clearly visible. The SPB line has single running along its entire length, with passing possible only at the central station of Breitlannen and the passing place at Rotenegg. Both lines cross the Lucina River side by side, but immediately thereafter, our way diverges and steepens as we begin our ascent of the mountain. The Schienega Platte track is especially steep, with a maximum gradient of 1 in 4 and an average of 1 in 5.2, for we have to gain over 1,300 metres in height during the course of the journey. Rack assistance is used along the entire seven kilometers of line, with the Pauli Riggenbach system being utilized. The name Schieniger Platte, derived from Schienen or Shine, is said to be a reference to the shale found here, which glistens in both sunlight and rain. Our train's top speed is only 12 kilometers per hour, which makes for a leisurely journey and gives time to admire the panoramas on both sides. The higher the track climbs, the more spectacular the views become. The station at Breitlaunen is a scheduled stopping place. In the days of steam, trains had to break the journey here to take on water, but today there's only a short pause to allow passing. A guest house, built here in the middle of the 19th century, was purchased by the railway and enlarged to become a spa hotel. This was closed in 1974 and subsequently demolished. The terrain is particularly challenging on the upper part of the line and the track needs constant attention to keep it in good order. During the 1980s, extensive work was carried out on the 162 metre long Greatly Tunnel to counter the creeping erosion of the steep floor. This excavation, one of four on the line, has the nickname of the Ooh and Ah Tunnel, reaction to the breathtaking views of the Bernese Oberland visible at the exit. All services were steam propelled for the first 20 years of operation, with six locos being purchased from SLM. Similar engines were bought by the neighboring Wengenaubahn, which also operates with 800 mm gauge. 
Today, a stable of vintage HE22 electric locos propel the coaches along the line. Four of these were purchased by the SPB upon electrification, and others acquired from the WAB when that company modernized their stock during the 1960s and 70s. These wonderful old machines, dating back to the early 20th century, were built by SLM, with electrical equipment by BBC, and are still in splendid condition after over 80 years in service. There's been a hotel at the summit since 1832, one of the first mountaintop hostelries built in Switzerland. In the 60 years before the coming of the railway, it was almost exclusively patronized by mountain climbers. But since the arrival of the train, the delights of this peak have been open to all. The end of the line is at Schienega Platte station, almost 2,000 meters above sea level. Here, passengers have the opportunity to stretch their legs and enjoy the attractions of the summit. A fascinating garden was opened here in 1929 by the Alpine Garden Society, and countless visitors make the pilgrimage every summer to view the wide variety of flora which represents the majority of specimens typically found in the Swiss Alps. Over 500 species of plants are grouped into 15 separate areas, such as a scree slope, alpine meadow, and dwarf heather region. Some of the plants are native to this mountain, while others have been brought here from other parts of Switzerland. A further walk to the top of the ridge gives visitors unparalleled views over the entire region. The twin lakes of Thun and Brienz lie over 1,500 meters below, both stretches of water clearly visible. The river Are flows between the lakes bisecting the two communities of Interlaken and Untersin, and the advantage of the Huematter can be fully appreciated as a green heart to the town. From this height, Interlaken Ost station takes on the appearance of a model railway, allowing us to appreciate the complexity of the lines in this mixed gauge layout. Keen walkers can take the path along the rock ridge to Faulhorn and the summit of the Fiescht cable car above Grindelwald. Specially organized moonlight rambles take place every August with the chance to marvel at the sun rising over the Alps. For a real bird's eye view of the region, however, it's necessary to take to the air for a gentle descent back into the valley. We rejoin our train at Wilderswil for the next stage of the journey with the Berner Oberlandbahn towards Weilutschinen. Just to the north of Wilderswil, there's the ruin of a 12th century fortification. However, Unspunen Castle precincts are more widely known as the site of the Swiss National Costume and Alpine Cowherd Festival, which first took place in 1805 and has been held just seven times since. These celebrations include a variety of folkloric events, including the feat of strength of tossing the Unspunen stone, which weighs no less than 81.4 kilograms, equivalent to an average man. 
The BOB line runs alongside the Lucina River for the majority of its route. The waters which rise in the glaciers of the region flow into Lake Brienz, eventually joining the mighty river Rhine, one of Europe's major waterways. All the lines on the Jungfrau Railways network are operated with single track running, and trains from Interlaken to Grindelwald and Lauterbrunnen currently combine in one long set as far as Weilutschinen, where the services divide. However, a construction program is taking place to make double track running possible from Gsteigwiele to Zweilutschinen. This is a major work for the BOB, for not only is new permanent way being laid and curves eased, but also bridges replaced or widened. The two major tributaries of the river, the Weisse, or White Lucina, and the Schwarze, or Black Lucina, flow down from Lauterbrunnen and Grindelwald to merge at the entrance of Zwei Lucinen Station, the name meaning two Lucinas. At Zweilucinen, the BOB tracks divide and the center of the train is uncoupled, a speedy and efficient process which doesn't cause any delays to the schedules. The Lauterbrunnen train is always positioned at the front of the rake and will leave about a minute before the Grindelwald service. The depot at Zweilucinen has handled all the BOB renovations and repairs since the opening of the line. Part of the complex was rebuilt in 1969, making a light and pleasant working environment. The sheds here are also home to two preserved steam locomotives, ex-SBB Brunig HG33 loco number 1067 and ex Raetian Railways G34 number 11, which make special excursions along the BOB and Brunig lines. The Berner Oberlandbahn operated with steam for the first 23 years of its existence, purchasing 10 HG33 and one HG22 loco from SLM. When electrification occurred in 1914, two of the machines were sold to the Kruhr Arosobahn to assist with the building of their line, while a further seven engines were exported to Italy. Two locos, both dating from 1893, HG33 number 5 and HG22 Eiger, remained in service before being broken up in 1956. In 1914, the BOB purchased eight HGE33 electric locomotives, numbered 21 to 28. They were built by SLM with electrical apparatus from BBC and MFO. A further machine, number 29, was purchased in 1926. She survives and is used to haul special trains along the tracks. So does number 24 who even after 70 years of service makes light work of pulling the preserved stock up the steep gradients to Grindelwald. In 1949, the first three rail cars appeared on the line, and further machines were purchased in the 1960s and 70s. Today, 10 ABEH441 cars, numbered 301 to 310, are in service with the BOB, one of which is heading our train. These work alongside three more recent additions to the fleet, numbers 311 to 313, one of which will haul us from Zweilutschinen to Grindelwald. We stay with the train to Lauterbrunnen as it runs in a southerly direction along the narrow valley floor towards the lofty alpine peaks. The two routes divide at the station, with the track to Grindelwald diverging to our left.
There have been settlements along the valley from medieval times, when mining was an important industry for the inhabitants. The iron ore was brought down to Zvailuchinen where it was smelted. After Lauterbrunnen, the valley steepens, and there are two places where our train must use rack assistance to tackle the gradients of 1 in 11. The river flowing alongside our tracks is the Weisse Lucina, the name alluding to the whiteness of its glacial waters. Across the river, the Jungfraubahn power station still stands, although today it no longer provides current for the railway. Instead, it's a works depot for winter sports maintenance vehicles. We leave the final rack section at the entrance to Lauterbrunnen station, a busy junction serving both the BOB and Wengenaup railways. The complex was rebuilt in the 1990s with a glass and steel roof designed to protect passengers from inclement weather. There were plans in the 19th century to extend the railway along the Lauterbrunnen valley and through a tunnel to Visp in the Rhone valley but lack of funds led to the abandonment of this ambitious idea. The impressive Staubach waterfall plunges for almost 300 meters down the valley side, providing an impressive backdrop to Lauterbrunnen village. Its magnificence inspired such poets as Byron and Goethe to describe it in their works. However, the Staubach is only one of more than 70 such cascades to be found along this valley, their flow fluctuating according to the time of year. Nature carved the U-shaped Lauterbrunnen Valley during the Ice Age, and although the Arctic conditions no longer prevail at these altitudes, the region is still dominated by the surrounding glaciated mountains. Indeed, the most spectacular of all the cataracts the Trummelbach Falls owes its form to the power of the Eiger, Munch and Jungfrau's glacial meltwaters. A series of ten cascades are open to the public between April and October, with much of this impressive complex lying inside the valley wall, where the tremendous force of the water has worn awe-inspiring caverns and potholes. Access is via a series of galleries and walkways, with a recently constructed lift inside the rock, allowing visitors an easy ascent to the middle section of the falls.
In full spate, up to 20,000 litres of water rush past every second, bearing thousands of tonnes of rock detritus down to the Lucina River each year. A short distance from the falls, a cable car rises from Stechelberg to the village of Murren, perched on the rock plateau almost 800 metres above the valley floor. This was opened in 1965 to augment the existing connection to the resort. When the railway reached Lauterbrunnen in 1890, Murren's population naturally wished to benefit from this new amenity, and a funicular was built to Grutschalp, to connect with the mountain railway along the plateau. The service opening on the 14th of August, 1891. The funicular runs in a completely straight line for over 1,400 meters, raising us 685 meters in altitude. The maximum gradient of one in 1.65 needed to achieve this made it, when it opened, the steepest cableway in the Bernese Oberland. Originally, it was powered by a water gravity system, with the top car loading ballast into a tank, which was then drained off during the descent to compensate for the weight of the wire rope. This made it difficult to drive and caused great wear on the brakes, so at the turn of the century, the system was electrified. Both cars have a goods platform attached to carry the necessities of life to Murren. All types of goods, from building materials to bottles of fizzy drink, travel up the side of the valley. In 1994, Grutschaub station was enlarged and an impressive machine installed to allow goods to be transferred from the funicular to the train with the minimum of delay and muscle power. Summer makes way for winter as we join the meter gauge mountain railway for a ride along the four and a quarter kilometer line to Murren. Although the track opened in 1891, it wasn't until 1910 that the winter service was inaugurated. In contrast to the funicular, gradients along this track are relatively gentle, with a maximum of 1 in 20. From its opening, the rail cars have been electrically powered, the third railway in Switzerland to use the new form of propulsion. The 500 to 550 volt DC current is supplied by a small power station on the upper Staubach. Just one of the early cars survives, now solely used on special occasions, so we're riding in one of the three rail cars purchased in 1967 from SIG with electrical equipment by BBC and SAAS. These units had to be winched, meter by meter, up the funicular tracks, as this was the only method possible to reach the mountain line. The views from the windows of our train are breathtaking, with the high peaks of the Eiger, Munch and Jungfrau across the valley seeming almost close enough to touch. The Eiger is the lowest summit, at just under 4,000 meters above sea level while the Jungfrau is the dominant peak of the region at 4,158 metres in altitude. The intermediate station at Winteregg is the only passing place along this line, and our train has to wait for its counterpart from Murren to arrive. The first hotel opened here in 1857, when the former von Almen farmhouse was transformed into the Hotel Silberhorn. runs through the summer pastures of the Grutschalp, Prastalp and Winteregalp, which disappear every winter under a white blanket. Walking and skiing are popular here, and the train in winter is crowded with holidaymakers enjoying the snow and sunshine.
the benefits of the railway to Murun became obvious immediately. About 15,000 visitors used the service during the first summer, while winter opening increased the passenger numbers to almost 70,000. Today, almost eight times that number avail themselves of this wonderful ride, with the railway now open all year round. The terminus of the line is at Murren Station, the present structure, dating from 1962, replacing an earlier wooden building. There's been a settlement here since at least the 13th century, although the first hotels didn't appear for another 600 years, when the village expanded during the 19th and early 20th centuries. Before the coming of the railway, visitors had to reach the village with the aid of mules, a fact which didn't deter such distinguished visitors as Kaiser Wilhelm of Prussia or the poet Tennyson. From 1894 to 1945, a little horse-drawn tram capable of carrying eight people ran through Murren, connecting the station and the Kurhaus. Winter sports in Murren owe a great debt to Sir Arnold Lunn, who was instrumental in popularizing skiing in Switzerland. He introduced the first winter sports season here in 1912, and 20 years later, the first Alpine Ski World Championships. The village was also the location for Switzerland's earliest ski school, and boasted the first ski lift in the region. However, Murren is not the summit of our journey, for in 1965, a cable car opened, allowing visitors to make an easy ascent from the village to the Schilthorn mountain peak. The construction of the cable car was a long and complex process, involving helicopter transportation for the majority of the building materials. Work began in 1963, and two years later the section to Berg was in service, with the entire route operational by the 12th of June, 1967. It's necessary to change gondolas at the middle station at Berg, giving one a chance to acclimatize on the sunny restaurant terrace to the thinning atmosphere and to pause before making the onward journey. Between Murren and Berg, two cabins are normally in operation. However, above Berg, only a single, larger car takes visitors to the summit. The cable car raises passengers over 2,000 meters in altitude between Stechelberg on the valley floor and Schilthorn and this same height difference can be made in reverse by intrepid skiers competing in the Inferno race. This is the world's longest and most exhilarating downhill run, with competitors setting off from the summit and making their own route down the mountain to end at Lauterbrunnen. The building which crowns the peak is famous the world over as Piet's Gloria, the sinister research station belonging to Count Blofeld in the James Bond film on Her Majesty's Secret Service. In fact, the complex houses a solar-powered revolving restaurant where diners can enjoy a complete 360-degree panorama of the mountains without leaving their table. The revolve is so gentle, there's no risk at all of spilling one Sunday. From the summit, at 2,970 meters above sea level, we have breathtaking vistas over Switzerland. On a clear day, it's possible to see from Mount Titlis to Mont Blanc, with no less than 200 alpine peaks visible. Back to Svalutschinen we go to resume our journey to Grindelwald, this time turning in an easterly direction to run along the Lucina Valley.
The rail car, which is hauling our train, is one of the three ABEH442 machines brought into service in 1987. They bear the names of the BOB terminus stations as well as being numbered 311 to 313. There are only two very short tunnels on the Berner Oberland Bahn, both along the line to Grindelwald. This is in marked contrast to the Jungfrau tracks, almost 80% of which are laid inside tunnel. After Lucental, the terrain begins to steepen and the train must avail itself of rack assistance. The BOB adopting the Riggenbach system, later used by the builders of the SBB's Brunig line. The gradient here increases to 1 in 8, the most severe found on the Berner Oberland Bahn. We must gain over 180 meters in height before reaching the next station at Burglanen, just over 2 kilometers away. The rail car has a top speed of 70 km per hour on the adhesion tracks, which slows right down to 30 kph when the rack is engaged. We leave the rack at the entrance to Burglan and Station. This is a scheduled passing place, and the down train is waiting for us to arrive and cross before it's able to proceed on its way to Interlaken. As the valley widens, we gain our first view of the impressive north wall of the Eiger, which has proved such a magnet to climbers from all over the world. On the outskirts of Grindelwald, we engage the rack for the last time to tackle the one in 9.3 climb to our destination at the center of the village. Grindelwald is the highest station on the BOB, and we've gained 467 meters in height since leaving Interlaken. This isn't just the terminus of the BOB line, but
but also the start of the Wengenaubahn tracks to Kleine Scheidig and Lauterbrunnen. Grindelwald has been a settlement from early times, although until the 19th century this was largely a farming community. The importance of tourism as the major source of income has increased during the last 200 years, and today visitors from all corners of the globe enjoy the beauties of the region. Grindelwald is known as the Glacier Village, owing to the proximity of two major ice sheets. Over the centuries, these have advanced and retreated, stretching right down to the outskirts of the village during the middle of the 19th century. The source of the Untergletscher is the impressive ice sheet of Eismere, or Sea of Ice, hidden away behind the Eiger Mountain. The action of this ice and its glacial meltwaters, which form the source of the Schwarze Lucina River, have carved out an impressive gorge over thousands of years. Specially constructed galleries and walkways have been erected to allow visitors access to this limestone wonder. And a gentle kilometer walk reveals the numerous geological features of this ravine. Further along the valley, lying between the Wetterhorn and Strechthorn mountains, the mighty Oberer Gletscher towers over the village. In order to take visitors from the edge of the glacier to a viewing point on the Wetterhorn, the world's first large cable suspension railway was opened here in 1908. It closed, however, during the 1930s. Today, access to the base of the glacier can be assisted with the help of a more traditional form of conveyance. However, to gain a close-up view of the ice mass itself, it's necessary to make a steep ascent on foot. A special stairway was erected in the 1990s, comprising some 890 wooden steps laid up the side of the rock. A testing walk even for the fit, and not recommended for those with heart conditions. The reward of this enervating climb is a close-up view of the glacier snout, as well as a visit to the intriguing grotto tunneled into the ice. It's possible to continue the journey further into the land of perpetual ice and snow by taking the Wengenaup train from Grindelwald to Kleiner Scheidig, passing right beneath the infamous north face of the Eiger. Here we can change to a Jungfraubahn train to complete our spectacular journey to the top of Europe affording us the opportunity to visit the Ice Palace and admire the breathtaking views over Switzerland from the Sphinx Viewing Terrace. For the journey of a lifetime, ride with us along the splendid Jungfrau Railways.